is to talk a little bit about uh, some of South Carolina's uh, forgotten or hidden history of labor radicalism and political radicalism. Uh, and uh, so I put, call this talk uh, Strangers to Our Own History, Labor Radicalism in, in South Carolina. Now, South Carolina is generally not the uh, state that we think of when uh, historians talk about the history of American labor radicalism or just uh, radical progressive politics in general. South Carolina is generally not the, uh, the, the state that, that springs uh, first to mind for, for most historians. And, and the reasons for that, I think, are uh, probably pretty obvious to most of the people in this room. Uh, you know, we have currently a rate of unionization that's under 4%. And over at least the last 10 years, uh, we've traded places with North Carolina for the lowest rates of unionization. When you take out public sector workers, that number is even lower, uh, amazingly. You know, nationally, the, the uh, uh, rate of unionization is about 11 or 12 percent, according to the latest figures. Uh, and that's down from a high in the late 1950s of about 35 percent. So you can see there's been a tremendous drop. Now, the reasons for the low rate of unionization in South Carolina uh, are rooted in the underdevelopment of the uh, industrial economy here, uh, also a deep-seated divisions, uh, deep-seated racism among the, the uh, workforce here in South Carolina. And that's reinforced by uh, a long tradition of political conservatism, which all of us are, are pretty, pretty uh, familiar with. You know, most uh, Governor Haley is really only the, the kind of most recent manifestation of that state hostility to unionization. And uh, some of you know, in February, she was talking to a group of automakers, and uh, she said to uh, the automakers who were gathered at a convention in Greenville that South Carolina would not welcome employers who are unionized into the state. As she said, uh, basically that would pollute the, the South Carolina workforce. The free people of South Carolina would be tainted mm -hmm. by uh, the, the uh, a unionized employer. So that hostility runs deep historically and it continues into uh, our current times. But nonetheless, as I tell my students, South Carolina is not at all at the periphery of the history of American radicalism, nor is it at the periphery of the history of uh, the American labor movement. Rather, I would argue that it's, it's always been at the cent center of the history of the American labor movement. And uh, time and time again, we'll see where South Carolina workers actually have taken the lead in shaping the, the pivotal events in the history of the American working class. So what I'm going to focus my uh, brief remarks are just giving you a few examples of what I mean by that. The first example that I'll mention takes us back to the, the earliest days of the Civil War, to something called the Port Royal Experiment. The Port Royal Experiment came about because the Union Army liberated uh, Port Royal, liberated uh, Beaufort and the Sea Islands all the way up to Charleston uh, in the early months of the Civil War. And what that did is it created a space whereby the free, uh, free men and free women were joined by political and religious visionaries coming down from the north who wanted to be a part of setting the terms or articulating what the post-war political system and economic system would look like. I tell my students that it's something akin to the Freedom Summer of 1964 that we're currently celebrating the 50-year anniversary. This was 250 years ago when uh, a, uh, an older generation of radicals came down from Philadelphia, came down from New York. They joined the free people in beginning to shape what a democratic, biracial uh, political system would look like. Now, they weren't always successful. Um, the uh, free people came up against a new class of uh, plantation owners. They came up against, oftentimes, blooded heads with the US Army. But nevertheless, it was uh, workers like the day laborers on the Combahee River rice plantations who went on strike in the uh, fall of 1876 
who began to really shape what the post-war Southern economy would look like. Uh, those uh, day laborers, most of whom were women, were demanding to be paid in cash rather than checks that were only redeemable at plantation stores. And what those women said is that they want cash so that they could spend that cash uh, for uh, uh, doctor's care for their children. Uh, they wanted to be able to, to uh, uh, purchase goods, purchase clothes, purchase food outside of the plantation stores that uh, overcharged them. You know, so uh, in this way, we see where South Carolina workers were absolutely, and, and what happened at Port Royal, that Port Royal experiment, then became the model for reconstruction uh, as it unfolded in the, the post-Civil War world. So South Carolina workers here are absolutely central to the, uh, the history of American labor. Uh, fast forward to the Great Depression. Uh, once again, Carolina workers are at the center of labor history. Uh, it was in 1934 that Carolina workers were the main force in the uh, 1934 general textile strike, which at the time, this was the largest strike in American history. Nearly half a million workers went out uh, across the country, most of whom were in the Carolinas, and the most militant, most radical workers were in the South, in the upstate of South Carolina and in North Carolina. The workers were coming together to protest uh, their low wages, which weren't keeping pace with, uh, uh, you know, were, uh, weren't able to feed their families during the Great Depression. They were also demanding recognition for their union uh, and protesting the, the stretch out, which was the company's uh, effort to put more work on the workforce. Uh, without compensating them appropriately. Now that strike was brutally suppressed by the mill owners. We had seven mill workers who were murdered by company gun thugs in Honium Path in the upstate. Uh, it was also uh, suppressed by the state. The state of Georgia imprisoned a number of the strikers and they put them to, in jail in uh, a prison camp outside of Atlanta that had been a prison camp during uh, World War I for German prisoners of war. Uh, our men and women were put in that prison camp in Atlanta, a prison camp built for uh, the, the Germans in World War I, but American uh, textile mill workers from Georgia were, were kept in that same camp. So the strike in the short term at least was a bust, but nevertheless it paved the way very directly uh, to the passage of the National Labor Relations Act in 1935. And from that flowed a major wave of industrial unionization. Uh, and, and that's currently the, the labor law under which uh, uh, trade unions operate uh, you know, today. So every trade unionist today owes a debt of gratitude to those Carolina workers who made those sacrifices back during the, the, the general strike. And I would say, uh, really, every member of the middle class, by extension, owes a debt to those Carolina mill workers because it was uh, the National Labor Relations Act, more than any other piece of federal legislation, really gave rise to the modern American middle class. So once again, Carolina workers are at the center of the, uh, the, the history of American trade unionism. We also have, just within uh, two miles of the Avery Center here, we have two examples of uh, what historians call civil rights unionism. This is the fusion of civil rights activism, anti-racist activism, with labor rights. Uh, we saw this in 1945-1946 uh, at the Cigar Factory down on Bay Street. If some of you are, are from out of town and visiting Charleston, I hope you get a chance to visit the, the uh, site of the Cigar Factory. There's also a nice historical marker. Uh, in 45, 1946, beginning at the tail end of World War II, uh, black, black and white workers at the cigar factory went out on strike, demanding higher wages, demanding uh, compensate, deferred compensation that had been promised them, uh, and uh, also protesting racial discrimination in the, in the plan. That strike was moderately successful. Um, a militant union emerged from that strike, the food, tobacco, and agricultural workers, and continued on until that plant closed 
uh, I believe in the, the 19, late 1970s, early 1980s. But from that strike, the, the protesters, as they were marching uh, down on America Street, they sang a version of an old gospel song, I Shall Overcome Someday, and they transformed the, the lyrics of that song to We Shall Overcome, which was introduced more broadly into the labor movement, uh, subsequently is introduced into the civil rights movement, and then that became Charleston's cultural gift, a political cultural gift to the world, as that became uh, a global anthem for freedom and justice. You had workers singing that song uh, during the Solidarity Movement in Poland. You had workers in South Africa singing We Shall Overcome. And uh, it, it, you know, it, it has direct roots to, to Charleston, to uh, East Bay Street, to the cigar factory. Uh, in 1969, uh, you had, uh, in many ways, a kind of repeat of what had taken place at the cigar factory. When at the Medical College uh, of Charleston, you had a strike that lasted for over three months. Mostly, uh, several hundred African American workers were protesting, demanding union representation, uh, demanding uh, better pay, and again, an end to racial discrimination. Those workers were organized by uh, Local 1199, which was a New York-based healthcare workers union. And they also had critical assistance from the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which was Dr. King's uh, civil rights organization based in Atlanta. SCLC in Local 1199 sent dozens of organizers into Charleston to uh, aid the strikers uh, in their efforts. That too was something that, you know, it, it ended somewhat ambiguously, but what it did uh, unambiguously is it marked the arrival of Charleston's black working class as a social and political force. Uh, it was shortly after the strike that the workers, as well as their supporters, organized a, a major voter registration drive in Charleston. It was only in, after that registration drive that Charleston began to elect African American public officials in any significant numbers in the early 70s. A lot of that work goes directly back to the, uh, the, the, uh, the strike at the, the Charleston Hospital. So fast forward to, to 2014, uh, where I would argue Carolina workers are once again taking the lead in uh, the uh, national movement to demand uh, a raise in the minimum wage. This is the fight for 15, part of a, a national movement for a higher minimum wage as well as union recognition. We've seen where it's uh, fast food workers in our own community as well as fast food workers in North Carolina have really played a, a very prominent role in that national movement. And it's already seen some uh, immediate results, especially uh, within certain municipalities, Seattle mainly has uh, moved toward uh, increasing their minimum wage significantly. I understand that New York City is on the, or New York State is on the verge of, of doing something similar, and we'll uh, hear from uh, some of the faculty workers a little bit later this evening. I'll leave you with this thought that uh, I, I believe that all of these, these struggles in which South Carolina workers have been so central to our national history of labor radicalism, uh, until we begin to see uh, South Carolina as central to the history of American radicalism, we'll continue to be on the defensive. So it's important for the continuation of these kinds of political mobilizations that we uh, begin to see our history in a whole different light. And uh, I'll, I'll close there. But thank you very much.